over the last two years, I've spent a lot of my time vigorously defending the idea of engaging with controversy on college campuses. And it hasn't been easy. Oftentimes, I've faced criticism. I've had to deal with ad hominem attacks. I've even, in several encounters, had to deal with death threats, implicit threats, letters and things like that slipped under my door. And throughout the course of dealing with those things, I often tried to ask myself, beyond the sort of legal definitions of free speech and beyond understanding it as an abstract value, what does it mean to me personally? And, you know, my grandfather passed away a few months ago, and so he's been on my mind a lot recently. And so I try to think back to some of the lessons that I learned from him. When I was a little boy, I loved spending time with my grandfather. He was in excellent shape. He taught me how to rollerblade when I was four, and he was like 82 at the time, <laughs> and which was you know, amazing to me. And uh, so we used to often go on jogs together. And he lived in Detroit, and he lived in, in a nice co-op, but in a, a neighborhood that wasn't so great. And so when we would go on these jogs, we would jog through sort of different parts of the community, and he would tell me to stay right beside him. And one day we were jogging, and there was a, a homeless man sort of sitting on the side on the curb. And you could tell that he was distraught. You could tell that he was a little, uh, he had a lot going on. And perhaps you could even tell that he was mentally unhinged. But at the time, I was so young, I didn't know what was going on. And so my grandfather, as we're jogging, he kind of pauses and he says, Zach, let's go this way. And sort of out of nowhere, the homeless man starts acting very erratically. And he starts yelling, screaming, and he's making loud noises. And he starts you know, cursing. He's talking to himself. And I asked him, I was like, Papa, what's wrong with this guy? Should we call the police? What's going on? And he said, then and there, he said, you always want to be careful not to make judgments about people before you know them, before you understand their circumstances, before you know what kind of conversations they had at the dinner table, before you know what kind of struggles they've had to deal with in their life, before you know what it is that they need, what it is that they lack, what it is that they want, what it is that they're trying to accomplish and the obstacles that they've had to encounter along the way. And so then and there, even though I was so young, I remember him trying to explain to me in words that would make sense to a four-year-old why it was important not to judge this, this man who clearly was without a lot for acting very erratically because I was very afraid when I saw it. And so I tried to sort of hold on to that memory and to apply that to different circumstances throughout my life. In my work with Uncomfortable Learning, I've invited two speakers who have been disinvited. One of them was Suzanne Banker. She was an anti-feminist social critic. And her main argument was that feminism in its current incarnation is a war against men. I radically disagree with this, radically disagree with it. However, I believe that it's very important to try to understand what kinds of experiences inform that perspective, on what evidence or lack thereof is it based, and to try to get a better sense of you know, who among the American electorate, who among our population, agrees with these views and why. And so in doing my work with Uncomfortable Learning, I've tried to you know, frame the reasons why in ways that I feel might be intelligible to people in ways that might make sense beyond just saying that free speech is a fundamental value in a democratic society, particularly in our society. You know, when we sort of watch the news, we tend to watch one of a few stations, Fox, MSNBC, CNN, and what we'll see is a particular version of events based on certain narratives that we're familiar with. If you watch Fox, you know, before 2016, you'd see a lot of criticisms of Obama. You'd see a lot of criticisms of liberalism. If you watch MSNBC, on the other hand, you're going to see an endorsement of Obama. You're going to see stories and coverage and commentators who support what he's doing, who advocate for him, who defend him and protect him, and so forth. And sort of in framing my work with Uncomfortable Learning, I've learned a lot as I've sort of progressed over the past two years. I've tried to point out that part of what Uncomfortable Learning is really about is essentially saying, if MSNBC is the station that you favor, watch Fox. 
if Fox is the station that you favor, watch MSNBC and don't try to counter every point. Just try to relax that impulse for a sec, try to withhold and just try to understand what is the other side saying? Why are they saying it? What is it that matters to them? Beyond the technical terms, whether it's taxation, whether it's affirmative action, whether it's welfare, what is the principle behind it? What's the reasoning behind it? Why does it matter? In explaining that, I've had a number of students who've said to me, well, you know, Zach, that makes sense, but this particular speaker that you want to bring, I find very hurtful. I find the language that they use, I find the arguments that they make to be hateful. And I think that they are a detriment to our society, and I think that for you to bring them to this campus is an ideological endorsement of their views. In response, I say, I understand that bringing this speaker is difficult. It's not easy for me to bring this speaker. I don't agree with probably 93% of what they have to say. However, whether it was Suzanne Vanker, whether it was John Derbyshire, the speakers that I bring, that I brought to campus, their opinions aren't just isolated. They're not the only ones who hold those opinions. They're social critics for a reason. There are millions of Americans out there who agree with those views. And for me, I believe that at the end of the day, what we have is communication. What we have is the ability to try to understand where someone else is coming from, to step outside of our own subject position. And sometimes when I say this, it resonates with people. They can connect with it, they can understand it, but it's still too difficult. And so then I say something like, I believe that every student at Williams College should have the opportunity, if they so choose, to listen to this speaker, to raise their objections, to make comments, to ask tough questions, and that if it is very difficult for you to do individually, perhaps consider not coming to the event. You know, it's not the case that I think everyone is well-suited or that it would be beneficial for everyone to go to, to listen to every speaker that I bring to campus. I understand that people have had traumatic experiences, that for some people, listening to a speaker speak about a very sensitive issue can, for them, almost be like reliving a trauma. I think that for college students in America, for American citizens in general, there are a number of ways in which we can deal with disagreement, a number of ways in which we can engage controversy productively. For those students who may not be able to go to the talk, they can read the books. They can listen to podcasts like Nico's. You know, there are a number of ways in which we can try to step outside of our own subject position and try to understand where other people are coming from. And so that's been a part of my, my own uncomfortable learning process, is trying to find ways in which I can explain why the work I'm doing matters to me. Oftentimes, I often get another criticism, and this criticism is that these ideas, let's take the idea for one that it is a guy that I invited to bring to campus, Charles Murray, uh, says that welfare does not necessarily help. Well, he doesn't say it doesn't necessarily help. He says it doesn't help the poor. It, in fact, injures them. Uh, it, it makes it their, their circumstances are ones in which uh, they become comfortable with relying on the government for assistance, and therefore it decreases incentives, and it, it runs counter to capitalism. If you take that kind of argument and you think about it, and you abstract it, it's very easy to point out every single thing you'd like to disagree with. I think that's very important. I think that part of uncomfortable learning is about thinking through the logic of your opponents. There are times in which there are arguments and I want to win those arguments. But there's other times in which I try to kind of step away from that perspective that says, I'm right and you're wrong. My side is good, your side is evil, and it's a battle and I have to win. Because when we see it that way, when that's the way in which we view what we're doing, it oftentimes makes us more antagonistic, it makes us more combative, and I don't think we're as good of listeners as we could be 
if we simply focused on trying to understand where other people are coming from. This comes from a recent study done by the Pew Research Center. And essentially what the study shows is that we get most of the information that we have about current events uh, from social media and from news websites. So that's the Wall Street Journal, that's the New York Times, that's Facebook, that's Twitter. In dealing with the controversy surrounding uncomfortable learning, a lot of the criticism that I've received has come from social media. And so whenever I'm talking about the work that I'm doing, I think it's always important to point out that one thing that's very different about engaging with controversy in this day and age versus 20 or 30 years ago is that when you have social media platforms, it makes it very easy for one person to post a comment that then galvanizes and mobilizes a group of people around a particular event. Triggers responses, response after response after response. And so when you hear notions such as you know, college students are coddled and they're hypersensitive and they're intolerant, I think there is a degree to which those characterizations hold water. Yet, however, at the same time, it's more complicated than that. You know, these college students didn't all themselves design social media. They didn't design the world in which they live. Uh, we're oftentimes you know, dealing with the situations, uh, the cards that we've been dealt, the situations that we find ourselves in. And so when we think about the effect that social media has on discourse, I think it's important for us to resist the tendency to just click on or view the articles that we like. Because part of the way the algorithms work on Facebook and even on Twitter too is that whatever it is that you like, whatever it is that you subscribe to, whatever it is that you comment on often, you're gonna see more of that stuff. Right, and so one of the premises of uncomfortable learning is that you're gonna try to do something that's gonna push your intellectual limits a little bit. If I love reading Mother Jones or you know, let's say The Nation, then I'm gonna read The Weekly Standard and The National Review. And so when I talk about the effects of social media, I try to point out the importance of resisting the tendency to just take in information that we find confirms our own beliefs, confirms the views that we hold dear. A Supreme Court Justice, Louis Brandeis, not only a historic figure, but I think has one of the best quotations on the importance of free speech in America. That without it, sort of the discovery of political truth, the meaning of conversation, the meaning of dialogue, and the marketplace of ideas is constrained. If we are to embrace the full meaning of democracy, the full meaning of what it means to be a citizen, then that means that we have to work through the tensions that come along with disagreement. That means that we have to engage with the emotions that are inevitable. Because I don't think there are any of us in here who can't find some issue that we don't find somewhat more difficult to discuss. Part of, what, part of what I've tried to do is encourage people to not see those issues as something that we should sh shy away from or run from or hide from, but something that we should confront, something that we should engage with thoughtfully, to rethink our own assumptions, to test our own conclusions, and to ultimately strive for empathy. What my grandfather was trying to convey to me on that day, when I was just a little boy, was that when you see something that unsettles you, when you see something that disturbs you, the best way to respond to that, the best way to deal with that, is not to simply characterize it in a way that's dismissive, is not to make judgments of another person that you wouldn't want made of yourself if you were in that situation, but is to try to understand what are other people dealing with, what are the experiences that have informed their opinions? What are they trying to accomplish? And fundamentally, what matters to them and why? If we do that, I believe we can come together in cooperation for mutual enlightenment. And I believe that on an individual level, we can create positive change. Thank you.